This photo is, for me, amazing in so many ways, including that when you look at it for a while, after you start to look beyond the low hills that are kind of in the Washoe uh, Mountains, but, but leading towards the Sierras, if, if, you, if you look at it for long enough, you start to see a figure in the mist. And in a way, that's what O'Sullivan is. O'Sullivan's a kind of figure in the mist. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration Book Talk presented by my organization, American Ancestors and GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs and Partnerships, the creator of this series and your host tonight. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us in the land of American history, looking at our westward expansion in the 19th century and at photography, a service, an art form that was in transition after the Civil War, just as our country was. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event centered on the book Double Exposure, Resurveying the West with Timothy O'Sullivan, America's most mysterious war photographer. Soon, author Robert Sullivan will join us on screen, and for approximately 40 minutes, he will share more about his new book, Robert Sullivan's research and his book are a tremendous resource for those of you who are doing research on the West or on the history of photography. Double Exposure is full of maps, photographs, names, businesses, wartime, and government history, as well as general wisdom and insight about westward expansion. It also displays Ansel Adams-like beautiful, haunting photographs. It's armchair travel with a great raconteur. Now, for more information about our author and presenter this evening, Robert Sullivan is best known for his probing investigations of place, pieces published in the New Yorker magazine and in previous books, including his most recent, My American Revolution, and his previous works, The Meadowlands, a whale hunt, and rats, as in the furry, string-tailed inhabitants of New York and other cities. I have been delighted and learned so much watching videos of his past book talks, and of course, in reading his magazine pieces. In addition to The New Yorker, Mr. Sullivan's writing has appeared in The New York Times, A Public Space, and Vogue. He is the recipient of a 2022 Guggenheim Fellowship. So welcome to you, Robert Sullivan. Um, it looks like you are in the camp, Robert, of living. Well, I've lived everywhere. I you were born um, in uh, is it Staten Island, and then you moved to Portland, Oregon. You would tell us all the places that you have been. Uh, most recently, Philadelphia, that foodie city, that that cosmopolitan creative city. Where uh, yes, Phil, Phil, I live in Philadelphia now, which um, is very um, food interested. And um, I, I'm, I'm often feeling like I'm one of the very few people who has not yet won a James Beard Award in film. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, and, it, and it's an amazing place. And I, yeah, I did. I grew up in New York. I was actually born on the island of Manhattan. Um, Staten Island's an island that I think some relatives came from. But um, and then I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in the West, in Oregon. Moved there lived there pretty much through the 90s um, on account of my wife is from there. She's from Portland, Oregon. And uh, in fact, right around when we moved out there, just before I'd been introduced to the photography of Timothy O'Sullivan and the Western surveyors in general. Oh, wow. We are so fascinated about it. I mean, you and him and you are now in Ripton, Vermont. Is that right? You survived the waters um, and you are here to tell us more. And you are not nearly as itinerant as Timothy O'Sullivan. Um, we really can't wait to hear more about of him. So over to you. Thanks for okay. being here. All right. Well, thanks. And uh, I'm just going to put on my uh, air travel headphones so that I can um, bring everybody in Uh for a safe landing in, in the Western United States. Yes, I'm in Ripton, Vermont, which is just outside of Middlebury. I'm working at a school called the Breadloaf School of English. I'm in the middle of the Green Mountains, 
And I'm I'm so not Timothy O'Sullivan in the sense that I'm living here for about six weeks. I have no car. I can only walk. I can only go as far as I can walk. And I don't have a horse or mules. They took they rode a lot of mules on the survey. So I was going to um, try to walk you through some of O'Sullivan's photos. And already I should point out that my name is Sullivan. His name is O'Sullivan. It's very confusing. Someone might recommend that you don't write a book about O'Sullivan for the sake of not confusing people if your name's Sullivan, but I did. And I'm now going to share the screen uh, and hopefully uh, show you some of O'Sullivan's photographs. So um, I'll start with this photograph. Uh, this photograph is made in the West. It's made in what is now Nevada and was then just about done being the Nevada Territory, states and territories being very different in terms of how control works for, for in, in this case, the US government, but also for the people who lived and live there, the Washoe people, um, and various Paiute uh, and, and Northern Shoshone people who live around there. But anyway, this is just outside of Carson City. It's between Carson City, Nevada, and Reno, Nevada. And it's a fissure. Um, there's this tremendous geothermal activity there. And O'Sullivan made this plate in the winter of 1868, somewhere between the end of 67 and 68, beginning of 68. He made it at a place called Steamboat Springs. It was named for that because it sounded like a steamboat when the geothermal activity was such that there was rumbling and that steam was generated, especially in the winter, from this really crack in the earth, this connection to the kind of the deepest, hottest places in the, at the center of the earth. So this photo is, for me, amazing in so many ways, including that when you look at it for a while, after you start to look beyond the low hills that are kind of in the Washoe uh, mountains, but but leading towards the Sierras. If, if, you, if you look at it for long enough, you start to see a figure in the mist. And in a way, that's what O'Sullivan is. O'Sullivan's a kind of figure in the mist. Timothy O'Sullivan is a, is a war photographer, as I'll show you. He's, a, he's famous for taking photos of, of the Civil War, but he left no notes, no journals, no diaries. He was assigned to go to the West, um, with two military or quasi-military surveys. They went to the West. Uh, again, his notes show up as scratchings on these photographic plates. He shows up in kind of expenses and command reports, but he himself really didn't leave a story. We don't have a story for him. But what we do have are these amazing photographs and if you're me, you can imagine or try to imagine what it was like for this human being to set up a tripod in this spot, a giant wooden tripod with a kind of mini fridge size, sized wooden camera, and to drop a plate in the back of it. The plate is called a wet collodion plate, and I'll say a little bit more about what that is and what that means. But in fact, this is a wet collodion plate image, a giant glass plate that he made in the middle of winter on one of these Western surveys. And again, it encapsulates the fact that he's a mystery. But he's a mystery whose value is in, well, if you resurvey where he went, as I tried to do, then you get to see a lot of America. So these are all the places that he went. And this is a map that's in the book, How I Came to Study the Western Landscape Photography of Timothy O'Sullivan, the unknown photographer who made the most famous pictures of the Civil War. So you can see up on the right here, he worked as a teenager in New York, growing up in Staten Island. But really his story starts down in New Orleans or starts when he's two years old. He's just moved to New Orleans from Ireland. He's born in Ireland. He leaves Ireland around 1840. Again, all these dates aren't exactly knowable, but there are records of him being in New Orleans. Uh, around 1842, he's got a sister after a few years, his mother and father. His father will be listed later as a carpenter. Sometime when he is a teenager, he moves up to Staten Island 
And from Staten Island, he winds up in the studio of Matthew Brady, who's probably the most famous Civil War photographer, uh, who's probably one of America's most famous photographers. He works with Matthew Brady for a while and then ends up when the Civil War starts, Matthew Brady begins to try to document the Civil War. And so O'Sullivan makes some of the first photographs of the of the the battle between the North and the South, if you will. He makes them in South Carolina, possibly as an army lieutenant. Uh, again, these the records don't exactly tell us, but he worked for the army or he, and he was photographing for Brady or Alexander Gardner, who was a partner of Brady and then broke off from Brady. But the the situation's kind of fluid as far as the records go, but it was not unusual for photographer, photographers to photograph stuff and maybe sell those photographs, but also to work for the army to make photographs of maps so that you could print out the maps and pass them around in, through the command. Um, he also made photos of views and, um, and and even made photos of the troops. It was well known if you were a Confederate soldier that you shouldn't be in a photo because they might find you if you were a Confederate spy, for instance. After, the, after New Orleans, he begins to move to the West. I mean, he moves to the West on his first survey when he's assigned in 1867 to go with Clarence King to the to the what's called the Great Basin of the United States, which is this giant basin that's kind of below the Snake River and circles down through the bottom of Nevada and it doesn't quite get to the Four Corners. The second survey that he goes out on with another commander is basically of the Colorado Plateau. So in that survey, he's uh, he's in Colorado. He is down in New Mexico and Arizona, and he's photographing all the places that I'll show you, or some of them. But first of all, it's important to note that he is this incredible Civil War photographer. This is a photo that he made from a church in Virginia looking down on a council of war. So this is a council of war. So commanders, colonels, generals are in a circle discussing what to do. The guy who's bent over the, the map right there is Ulysses S. Grant. This is an, a kind of incredible photo for so many ways, including it shows the way O'Sullivan puts you into the picture. You're looking down on these people. And one of the big things that's in the news at this point in history is that there's a group of people who are often referred to as sharps shooters, named for the particular kind of, of gun that, that is called a sharp shooter, made by a a guy named Sharp. And uh, this weapon means that you can suddenly shoot officers behind the lines. Um, this completely changes the kind of strategy of, of warfare. It, it, it's one of the things that changes it. And so now people behind the lines, commanders behind the lines, have to be careful in a way they didn't before. It's not just people in the in the push of the battle. This is, this is more like the push of the battle. This is an artillery unit. It's often said that because they were wet plate collodion photographers, which again has a big giant wooden box, you have to take a plate out, you have to sensitize the plate with one liquid and then sensitize it with another liquid. But because you have to do all that stuff and then run from the, the sort of dark tent uh, back to the camera, it takes a few minutes to do this, maybe up to 15, 20 minutes sometimes. But because you do that, you can't be in battle, quote unquote. But in the, in the past sort of 10 years or so, people have started to think that maybe he was photographing while they were firing. And you could say, well, he's off to the side of the guns that are firing, but he's not very far from the side of the guns that are firing. And that means that potentially people are firing at them. There is an account of him made by someone else having his camera nearly shot out from under him. But he also travels with a group of engineers, primarily from New York, New York State, and likely also from Ireland, or some of them were of Irish descent. But he specializes in photographing their work. It's one of the things that he ends up specializing in as when you look back at all his photos. And he photographs their work, which is setting up bridges. Setting up bridges, or else, and this is um, these are pontoon bridges, or else, and photographing blown up bridges, Bridges are meant to be built during the war, and they are meant to be destroyed. This is a photo that I find really intriguing. I wish it were. I wish I had a giant 
image of this at home or played with this. I think it's an amazing photo. There's a broken down bridge behind them that's been destroyed by Confederates. This is the New York unit of engineers, and they're trying to find some peace, it would appear, in the river. And because of the exposure and the time, the river itself is, has this creamy movement to it. Could even look like ice, but it seems like, and I'm projecting here, a kind of bomb uh, after in the midst of battle. This is how he tra traveled around and, and did his photog photographic work during the war. They used these wagons. Sometimes they used army ambulances, and it allowed him to mix his chemicals, carry water, and to do all the work out inside that or traveling dark room. This is a very famous picture that is made of Matthew Brady. And I put this up because while we think of Matthew Brady as this great Civil War photographer, in a way he was kind of like the head of the Associated Press Photography Bureau in New York, where he's in charge of a number of photographers that he has sent out. He did take, he did make daguerreotypes in his early days. He also did wet plate clothing photography and clock photography generally, but he hired people to work with him, including Alexander Gardner, a guy I've mentioned before who came from Scotland and was a kind of social reformer. And this young guy, O'Sullivan, who lived like Brady in Staten Island, Staten Island being, you know, this is maybe a side note, but being kind of a bastion of photography in New York City in the 1840s and 50s. But this is this is Reynolds. This is the this is the field where General Reynolds was shot, except he might not have been shot exactly there. But this is Brady asking to be photographed, asking one of his assistants to photograph him in the field. This is Brady showing what an important photographer he is and how he's covering the war, which by the way, his wife said he shouldn't cover because it would ruin him financially and which by the way, ruined him financially. So one of the notions that I take with me as I go out to look at, again at O'Sullivan's books, when I, as I first, I have to look at the civil war and see where he's taking off from. And I, I, I suggest this proposition, which is, what if we think that the Civil War wasn't necessarily civil and that moreover, the South won? Or if it didn't win, it shook hands with the North at the end of the war and they moved together into the West. One of the ways I think about that and think about that idea in the photographs that I'm looking at is I go back to the most, one of the most famous in terms of the history History of the Civil War, books of photographs, and also one of the first books of photographs, if not the first sort of photographic photo book in the US, Gardner's Photographic Sketchbook of the War. You'll notice, first of all, that it's called, when it's published, just after this, what we call the Civil War, when it's published, it's called that Sketchbook of the War, not of the Civil War. That term doesn't get into full use until many decades after the war until after the North returns the battle flags to the South. I believe that was President McKinley who did that. Until after Reconstruction ends, and still after we pull federal troops out of the South and leave newly unenslaved people to themselves to fight the, the people who don't want that to happen, the former Confederates, just for instance. But this is the book, this, this is the war in made in this book that's and and the way he's remembering the book with this with this sketchbook is he's making landscape pictures of pl of places where battles happened there aren't necessarily battles still going on there although in the book are a lot of O'Sullivan's photos of battles but it's about uh remembering the past the person who made this book Alexander Gardner with O'Sullivan had a close relationship with President Lincoln. In fact, it's thought that he had a kind of a photo room or a room to photograph in the White House. Lincoln posed for him many, many times. And, it, and also, it is thought that O'Sullivan would have assisted Gardner on these shoots. So O'Sullivan would have been in contact with, with this operation of photographing the president, the president who, in particular, understood the value of photographs, as did Frederick Douglass, one of the most photographed people in the world, and Sojourner Truth, who used the sale of carte de visites of herself to, to give her money, help her get money to support her campaign for rights for black Americans. This is the most famous, I would argue, or certainly, if not the most famous photograph of the Civil War, certainly a photograph that comes up if you Google images of the Civil War, or if you remember your high school 
books on the Civil War. This photograph is called The Harvest of Death. It's in that book we just looked at the cover of. That book, by the way, in the 1950s will be republished by Dover and it will be retitled Alexander Gardner's Sketchbook of the Civil War. This is after the 1910s when we sort of agree on that term, Civil War. Gardner made this photo as a kind of cautionary tale. In this book of photos, there are these long uh, captions that are kind of like literary sketches. They're 100, 200 words each, a lot of words, and they are meant to portray, as he writes here, a useful moral. It shows the blank horror and reality of war in opposition to its pageantry. Here are the dreadful details. Let them aid in preventing such another calamity. What I find most fascinating about this photograph, which is so, if you've been with O'Sullivan out in the world or followed his photos, photos around, so characteristically him, is that the details of the dead are stark and, 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 and bold and brilliant in the sense of their of their their strength. But the details of the living are not there. The living are blurred and in the ghostly figures in the distance on horses. Horses, of course, being, if you want to get symbolic about it, since the Iron Age, a symbol for humans of creatures that transfer between worlds. But there's also that kind of veil of mist across this photo that suggests that there's there's a place in the paint in the in the photograph that kind of feels like a painting to me. I gave it away, but also that seems that it it can seem like a portal. He's characteristically, I mean, I I think that he's amazing for the way he will give you something flat and in a way boring and sort of deathly mundane, but at the same time it leads you somewhere. It leads the viewer somewhere, and even if you remember that that shot of the generals from above, it leads you into thinking that you are in the place looking down on them where someone might be who is going to do something bad, which was in the popular uh, press, which was a notion that people were worried about in battle and so on. So he's, he's very much able to kind of put you in a place. This is a photograph that is not in that book, that is not in the, the Gardner's sketchbook. Gardner's sketchbook does not include any photographs of the USCT, which is what we call, which is the, the abbreviation or the, the letters for United States color troops, color troops. These are black soldiers who were enlisted. Frederick Douglass enlisted a regiment before it was they were allowed to necessarily fight. Um, but these are various regiments that were at once were at one were finally taken into the war officially. And they fought in the war, fought in some of the most incredible battles in the war, survived some, some incredible odds, and yet they're not celebrated in this book or noted in the book. And in fact, people in this book of the, the, the war that's not yet called civil, uh, who are people of color, are put in kind of characteristic ways that seem to indicate that things aren't going to be different after the war, that we're not going to have this kind of, this kind of amazing radical change. This photo, however, this photo is also not in the book. This photo is this uh, is a similar thing that O'Sullivan's photographing a river. It's a broken up plate. There's a stereo photo of this, and I think there's also a large format photo. But this this these are these are formerly enslaved people leaving southern lines and crossing a river into the north. The Emancipation Act has not yet been read, so they are not technically in a sense, quote unquote, unenslaved, but they are human beings who are crossing into another legal frame, which is incredible. Uh, the soldiers, particular general, announced that they would be considered contraband. That is, he could take them with him as if they were property, when it's, which in a sense, they sadly were. But this is a, an incredible transition moment in a river, in a stream. And there's actually an amazing story about this, about how the relative of someone who escaped slavery from the South and brought their family across this river discovered that story and how, how their family story related to this photo just by visiting a national park and meeting the right national park um, ranger to help them find this photo and go through it. But an incredible point. So the reason I, the way I got going was I decided to follow the sort of cue of some photo photographers in the 1970s who went back and re-photographed 
the Western surveys. This was my, my self-assigned task to think about where O'Sullivan was in the Civil War, to think about what the war meant then and how we've kind of added on meanings or different interpretations now, but to try to get back to that those some of those ideas, and then to follow his camera out. And rather than put in a photographic plate into the camera and to re-photograph those place, places, I would sort of pretend that I was a photographic place and try to re-feel and re-experience and re-survey and re-see, hopefully, or, or re-something these places. But this was a very kind of famous in photographic circles, uh, book of photographs um, that was done by a variety of people, um, Gordon Bushaw, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Mark Klett, uh, and Nancy Verberg was another photographer who did this. And they would use the old photographs, which is on the left here, and they'd re-photograph them on the right. And there's this great kind of kind of stereoscopic thing that happens in terms not of the image aligning so much as the the disalignment allowing for this kind of idea, uh, allowing for ideas to kind of bubble up in the in-between. And, and that's what I think O'Sullivan's great for, is kind of giving us an in-between to work with and to reconsider things. So here we go to the West, and here I am starting uh, in the Great Basin. And the first place I go to, one of the first places I go to is a place called Pyramid Lake, which is on the Pyramid Lake Paiute Nation's land today and was photographed by O'Sullivan in 1867. You can see that when he makes a photograph, again, I think of that photograph of General Grant in the circle. I think that he's almost carrying us out there as we look at it. There's something about this photo that draws me on, but I'm saying too much. I should probably just move through the photos. But but he, it's a kind of otherworldly place, this West. And that's kind of intentional by the survey commanders who are in a way asking him to make a West that satisfies their needs for when they go to Congress for money, for when they present to the public. But at the same time, he is working in his own way because he's a human being working. We go very quickly to, with O'Sullivan, to mines. The big reason that the first survey commander, whose name is Clarence King, who at the time was a kind of famous or about to be very famous a scientist who would discover the first glaciers in North America, who document them, who's the first sort of white man to document the glaciers. And he would also, by a weird stroke of geologic luck and timing uh, and overheard conversation, stop the kind of stock market from crashing by investing in a fake diamond field. That's a long story, but what I'll say here at the Curtis Shaft in Virginia City, Nevada, is these are miners from living in Virginia City. And Virginia City at the time is the most is a place that's just completely foreign born. People from all over the world are being assembled by mining companies to go into the mines and work for less and less money. You might've come out in 1847 to be a miner with a pan, but by 1860, you're working in what is essentially an industrial slum beneath the Great Plains, sorry, the Great Basin. And in fact, all the trees from the forests, the Paiute forests that are, that are that feed and nourish and are ceremony of a ceremonial value to the Paiute, are being those trees are being cut down and assembled like Lincoln logs in giant chambers underneath it, underneath the hills where the the earth is being dug out and piled up to make sort of scree mountains on top. And here are these miners working. And what's amazing here is that O'Sullivan has asked a miner to hold on a second while he lights a strip of magnesium so that O'Sullivan can make this photo, possibly of an Irishman, possibly from the county of Cork, which is known for hard rock miners, which is possibly where O'Sullivan is also from. So he's asking this guy who just likely survived an explosion in the mine not too long before where the whole mine blew out. He's asking him to hold on while he takes a picture with a small explosion next to him. And what's really amazing in the second photo is that the human being is barely in the photo. We see the pick and the boot, and we see the light as if it comes off, is coming in from the side. So it's, a, it's one, again, one of his like, seems simple for him to make these uniquely mysterious photos. And by the way, he's making just photo after photo in the West. This is the one I have behind me. This is a giant three mile long, mile wide sand dune that in fact sings. It's named for a snake in the Paiute language. And to the Paiute, 
it's a very, very important place that has significant power unto itself. It's more than ironic that it sits in the giant field of, well, of bombing runs, because this Great Basin is where the military moved all its armaments and its bombing test runs after World War I. So after these places are taken and incorporated by the government and by miners, it's also set up as kind of our armament place. But this dune in itself is an amazing picture because if you look at it, you can see that O'Sullivan's prints, footprints come up off the wagon, the ambulance, that's an army ambulance he's using in the West, and photograph back down from his footprints into this incredibly powerful dune. And it would seem as if he were at sea. This is how he photographed that first photograph, the fissure. You can see the setup of the photograph, which is a lot more um, behind the scenesy and boring than the actual photo, if you remember it. And this is me going back to the site to see where that photo was. The second survey, the first one he does with a guy named, a uh, civilian scientist named Clarence King, who convinces the army to let him run a survey. The second survey is with a guy who's not a scientist, but is an army officer. His name is George Wheeler. He's a fairly inexperienced surveyor. Um, he's done one other survey. It didn't go well. I think everybody almost starved. Uh, but he's got the second command. And his whole career, when he was at West Point, he's from Hopkinton, Massachusetts. But his whole career is sponsored by mining executives who sponsor him in cahoots, for lack of a less uh, dramatic 19th century word, in cahoots with senators senators and Congress people who do it discreetly, even secretly. So he goes to Canyon de Chez. A lot of you people will, who out there who love photography like me will recognize this as a photograph that reminds you of Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams was a, is a big reason why I'm sitting here talking about Timothy O'Sullivan. I, maybe I could say more about that later. But in this photograph, for an army commander, we see almost a kind of graph paper where we're putting in the kind of ruins, the White House ruins for, for in, in Canyon de Chez, which is on Navajo land and is now a place that is co-managed by the Navajo. But what's really amazing is he photographs Navajo land only just as the Navajo are returning to where they live after being kicked out by the Union Army during the Civil War. This is a photograph. I actually should have had it with the Clarence King photographs. I apologize, but this is one of my favorite photographs of him of all time. It's of the Great Salt Lake. It's of the Great Salt Lake Desert, which is adjacent to the Salt Lake. In fact, the Salt Lake sort of picks up in the back of the photograph, but it really encapsulates so much about O'Sullivan. It has the blankness, but it has that infinity that keeps giving. Here's the beginning of Wheeler's, the sort of third part of his survey. The first part, he's going to he surveys Death Valley at the hottest point of the summer. A bad idea. And it turns out, and nobody can figure out why he's doing it. The local papers are confused as to why the army's doing a survey until they figure out that he's running a secret mining expedition. Uh, the reporter on that, the sort of literary biographer of Wheeler, the kind of PR guy, is a guy named Loring, Frederick Loring, who's from Boston. But anyway, um, here he is setting out with Loring and everybody on the survey in boats uh, to survey the Colorado River. There's no need to survey the Colorado River. It's already been surveyed by General Powell and others years before. And he decides, even worse, even for to do a redundant survey by rowing upstream. By the end, he's he's ready. Everyone's starving. He's lost all the food the commander has. O'Sullivan has food on his boat with the geologist, and the commander has to come into his boat after the commander crashes his boat. O'Sullivan's rowing with some Mojave men who help him, who are the best rowers on the survey. But by the end, everybody's ready to get rid of this survey commander, who's clearly a criminal, but he's do or a crook rather either one. But he's doing this to to sort of build this beautiful portrait of a of a, an exploratory adventure. He's selling adventure as a kind of cover for the mining expedition. And O'Sullivan dutifully photographs on this trip. His hands are so hurting he can't make photographs for a day or two after this weeks long row up the Colorado River before dams. And towards the end of his career, he makes these photographs for Wheeler that are of what he calls what they call. Indian ruins. But in fact, that's not exactly what they are. They're ruins 
for a civilization or a group of people who lived there before the Navajo were living in the area. And their ruins, they're little pieces of great giant communal homes that are that are situated in the sun to heat them and cool them in such a way. And that it's sort of suddenly abandoned for no one's exactly, or not many archaeologists can't say exactly why, but it's got great storerooms for corn. And this is just a piece of it. But O'Sullivan uses this to make some pretty interesting photographs of himself and his packer, his assistant. And uh, for me, given that they come at the end of his career, and given that there's giant recession in the United States, even a depression, and that people are um, rising up um, against low wages, and that railroads have started to bankrupt the company, the country, he seems to me to be saying something about labor. And in fact, this photograph I find very poignant. This is among the last photographs he made in the West on this survey in 1873 and 1874. And it'll be among the last, it'll be the last photographs for all anybody knows that he ever makes. And we see his shadow, his shadow as a photographer in, in the Colorado Plateau. He is also incredible to me for having made photographs in the Navajo Nation here at Fort Defiance, which is now, uh, which is still a fort. Uh, there's a, a town there. There's a high school there on the Navajo Nation. He makes photographs that are that show people posed in a way that Matthew Brady would have posed soldiers to make them look noble. Matthew Brady posed um, indigenous people for P.T. Barnum, like the quote unquote Fiji cannibals. And they, of course, weren't cannibals, but he poses them looking straight into the into the camera, and it's kind of a kind of a stunt to make you scared. But these people, he poses as if they were diplomats, and diplomats at the time, or senators and congressmen, want to look the way they think a Roman senator would. So I think that is of value and interest. He also photographs them working, and Wheeler, his commander talks about Aboriginal life among the Navajos. But what's happening is these people are making rugs and selling them and using things like Germantown wool from Germantown, Pennsylvania that's being shipped and that's being traded for. There's a real thriving industry that's happening and, and people are surviving despite having been walked off their land. All these people died on the Trail of Tears. But the, again, the Navajo negotiate their way back to the place. The last series of photos that O'Sullivan takes are in the west of the Snake River Falls, which are celebrating an anniversary this year because Evil Knievel jumped over the Snake River Canyon uh, many years ago. But this Snake River Falls, which is... These falls are now slowed somewhat by dams, all the dams that are in the Pacific Northwest that now people are actually talking about taking out. But this fall seems to have amazed him. This is a very late photo. These are the last photos he takes. It's the only place in the West he goes twice. This is 1874 as well. He would appear to be trying to make bigger and bigger photos of these falls. And I guess the argument that I sort of make in the book or the idea that I lay out for you, the reader, to perhaps be with, or if you like, dance with, is the idea that some of these photos in the West start to look a lot like the photographs in the East. This is a kind of variant print in the sketchbook of that Civil War battlefield photo. And I start to see similarities in these things. And I wonder if the war photographer who left to cover another war after the one that he left didn't really end, but the war to take and, and, and incorporate this land, I start to wonder if the photographer um, was maybe seeing, seeing places again in the Eastern landscape when he came back that were reminding him of the war first in the East and then the kind of containment of people in the in the West that will lead to mining in the West, and you know, on the Navajo Nation now, the amount of uranium in, in young people's blood uh, because of all the uranium mining and the spills, it starts to match if you come back across the country as, as I did. It starts to make you think about all of the sort of contaminants that people are finding in people in the East, in Pennsylvania, in the Appalachians, where things are being mined, were being mined then. Um, it's interesting to me to know that fracking is a process that was invented by a Civil War general in the East. So what do what we think of as, as a military thing or a mining thing? How are these things conflated? How does all war start to fall into the landscape? And I'm back to that photo, which I could just keep looking at forever, but I'm probably pretty much towards the end. So I, I have a few photos left, but I'll save them because I'm hoping somebody have, might have a question and maybe along the lines of, 
can I move out of the way of the of the ambulance? So I'll I'll stop there and maybe be joined. I am indeed coming back. Thank you so much. What a fascinating presentation. Um, we really enjoyed those images and thank you for enlightening us as to Timothy O'Sullivan's enigmatic and artistic history. I really enjoyed the book and I enjoyed the presentation. And now for some audience questions, we got a good number of them. And um, I'm going to start with the advanced questions. I think we had more questions about Ansel Adams than about any other topic. And I must say these questions fall into a bunch of categories, photography questions, history questions, and then sort of general cultural environment questions. But why don't we start with the Ansel Adams question? Did he influence Ansel Adams? Did Ansel Adams know Timothy O'Sullivan? Yeah. So um, this, the photo, the next, the photo that I didn't show, this next photo, Timothy O'Sullivan made this photo of a place called El Moro. El Moro is a, such an incredibly starkly beautiful rise in, in the Colorado Plateau and the kind of bottom of what we call New Mexico now but um and on top there is a place where people lived it's being uh, there's archaeology work being done there by native american archaeologists and and also working with national monument the national parks people and anyway this this photo on the bottom there's a water hole there that people for centuries have stopped at and on the wall around the water hole are the etchings of you know a spanish attempted conqueror in in the 1500s or the 1600s you know there's markings by people who live there before the spanish came by all kinds of people who have gone through up to anglo settlers if you will and um and everybody kind of marks the wall and for me it's a it's a on the one hand it's a sign of like signing your name to the contract on the land but this is where ansel adams went to take a photo of o'sullivan's a signature. So Ansel Adams was fascinated by O'Sullivan's work, and he and a guy named Beaumont Newhall um, brought it to the Museum of Modern Art to Alfred Stieglitz to say, "This guy is amazing. He took these photographs that we are trying to take now, but they couldn't figure out how he could possibly do it. He wasn't trained in the art of photography the way they were. How could that be?" But this is the 1930s that they're doing this. The first big photo show at the Museum of Modern Arts, I think 1939 or 37, I can't remember, but it's, but this is when photography is, is more and more considered an art form, but it's, it's, it's really exciting to me that they look back at, at this guy when it wasn't considered art, but then you get, start to ask the question, what is art anyway? Fascinating. Um, moving on to a different question, on to history. While traveling Okay, were there more Confederate or Union soldiers and families that moved west after the Civil War? So I wouldn't have a hard number on that, but I can say that one thing that's kind of amazing about traveling around the West is, and I, I noticed is is that there's that there's both. And I noticed um, when I used to live in Oregon, I noticed that old time old time fiddle tunes, like old fiddle tunes, were in in certain parts of Oregon where there had been Confederate settlement, there, there were Southern tunes, and then there'd be Northern tunes, tunes from New England, like in Portland, for instance. So you had these different relationships that way. But likewise, California, for instance, is, um, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that I think two senators were in a duel over whether or not to have, to, to, to ban slavery in California. Um, it, was, it was a Supreme Court member and a senator maybe, but, the, but things were not, what we think they were in terms of who thought what that way. And as I, as I, you know, when, as I was going up the Sierra Nevada mountains where O'Sullivan photographed with King, um, the mountains watched them as they crossed death Valley. You see two mountains next to each other. One's named for the USS Kearsage and the other one's named for the USS Alabama. And they're, they're one's named for the Confederate um, boat and the Union boat, and they were both in a battle together. I think famously painted by um, by a French impressionist whose names escaped me at this moment. Looking at the 
history of photography and also his technique. Um, we have a number of folks asking about the technicalities of him producing these photographs in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. Where did O'Sullivan get his chemicals? Mm -hmm. um, also um, in the live chat, somebody's asking what percentage of photos were not completed um, or clear to view mm -hmm. due to the complication complications and the process of producing these in the field. If you could talk a little bit about, you know, how he did what he did Oops. in the field. Um, yeah. Oh, geez. I should put this back up. The, um, so, uh, so he, I was just going to look up, uh, I just wrote a piece for the New Yorker about how many of his wet plates, sorry, the plates that are no longer wet, that are the plates are in the national archives. I got to meet the person who takes care of them. No one except for this person has seen them for 20 years or so. They can't be checked in with regularly. They're in a sealed thing. And the majority of Civil War photos and the majority of photos that we have uh, of the West are by O'Sullivan. Um, he was His photos seem to not deteriorate, meaning they were done well. He got his chemicals. He would have started out. He got a lot of chemicals in New York from um, these two brothers who ran a company who supplied uh, a lot of people, um, including Brady. But he shipped a lot with them. The first time he went to the West, he went via boat through Panama. Um, the, you couldn't go through the canal, but he went boat to train to boat. And um, he carried chemicals with him. Um, later times, he took the train. But I bet you he could have gotten them in San Francisco because that's where they start out uh, on the first surveys when they leave the West because San Francisco has a lot of photographers. Carlton Watkins, of course, is somebody who Sullivan, O'Sullivan's boss, Clarence King, probably wanted to photograph the surveys because he was more famous. O'Sullivan's not that famous because he's kind of just a guy. He's like um, he's like the Chuck Yeager figure in, um, in the old movie, uh, The Right Stuff. He's not celebrated, but he's the guy who can do it. So, and Watkins takes a very different kind of photo, a photo that kind of celebrates the sort of glorious nature and so forth. O'Sullivan does not do that. O'Sullivan makes a very different picture, but they get their chemicals in San Francisco. Um, and, and the plate process is amazing, especially because the plate, to make the plate, you're going to wipe it with, you're going to, you're going to, um, uh, work it, uh, spread it with wet collodions, like maple syrup texture. And that's made from um, nitrocellulose, which is also called gun cotton. And that liquid is used on soldiers' wounds during the war to kind of close a gap in a quick way. But it's also used, gun cotton is used to power explosives. So, um, and then the last thing you do is put silver nitrate on it. The silver is what's being mined in those mines. And the Comstock load arguably financed the Union Army during the Civil War. It remains, if not the, then one of the largest, you know, silver strikes in the history of the of the civilized world. That's probably not the right phrase, but of the world. So um so he could get them, but he needed a lot of water. And I think in Death Valley, one of the reasons you don't have a lot of photos is because they ran out of water. They were all parched and people were passing out from no water. Turning now to a question about other photographers at the time. Um, of course, you have a section in your book about Clover Adams. And uh, in the live chat, somebody is asking, um, where does Edward... Ed, where does Edward Curtis come in the group of photographers? If you could just put him in context of other photographers besides Brady. Well, Curtis is much later. Curtis is funded in part by um, J.P. Morgan. Actually, I believe it's his one of the people who works for Morgan who, who kind of helps Curtis get his funding. Curtis is photographing significantly later and uh, in the early 1900s basically the very early if I, if I remember the dates correctly but i can but i can say for sure that curtis's photographs are are beautiful and they set out to um in a way they're in conversation with the culture and the culture is is embracing this idea of the last quote unquote indians or the lost indian so they're very romantic and they they are quite beautiful and i have some friends who live in the Macaw Nation, and some of the photos that he made of the Macaw uh, whalers uh, and fishermen are really beautiful and, and really powerful. 
but at this but it's, but they do have they are controversial in their way in, in local communities but essentially um it's 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 a real contrast between the earlier O'Sullivan taking these photos of people working and living their lives in a way uh, and Curtis kind of framing them to kind of be a part of the national narrative that seeks to get rid of Native Americans. I mean, we basically, with with various acts, uh, we we try to take a lot of land away. Um, the national forests come out of like like around where O'Sullivan's photographing, huge swaths of Apache land are turned into national forests. So there, the meaning of the photos, aside from them being technically brilliant, they have very different meanings. And I'm struck by the fact that O'Sullivan's come from a place that is being land cleared by essentially British, you know, by the British, by um, landlords. And the, the one group that comes out kind of in, in support of the Irish during the famine that, that says that they are being, it's a government doing land clearance is, are the Cherokee and the Choctaw who write with their own paper after the Trail of Tears to say, these people are being treated like, in a way, someone we know, that's someone being us. Um, and that's not, those statements are not digested significantly or enough in, in the 1840s. But to hear someone who's just been marched off their land say that people who are coming here as refugees and are, are being marched off their land and it's not just, and then to think that one of those people or someone in communication with those people makes these photographs, that's a really interesting thing. Uh, speaking of the Apaches, uh, we have a question here about um, Fred Loring. Uh, the Loring family is a big, prominent family in Boston to this day. And uh, and so we want to know what happened to Fred Loring. And also another question in the live chat is sort of related. Um, are Native Americans in his photographs or were the surveys, you know, did they did they visit their lands or and did and do are they remembered in the oral history of the Native Americans? So sort of the again on your topic before the intersection of these two groups. Well, that's really interesting because um, the 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 sisters. Um, oh my gosh, maybe somebody in the chat can remember the name of the sisters who publish. They are uh, Hawthorne's married to one of the sisters. And anyway, they publish Sarah Winnemucca's biography, um, autobiography. Sarah Winnemucca is a Paiute activist who is with the surveyors and helps them not die when a bunch of mean people, uh, that is, the tendency is to say like a wild bunch of Indians come in 18, 1868. But no, it was basically, um, it, it's not even that clear who it would have been. Um, and Sarah Winnemucca's family has been attacked several times by, um, there's a massacre of her community by Union soldiers uh, very near um, very near Pyramid Lake. But Sarah Winnemucca goes out of her way to save some of the geologists on the Clarence King O'Sullivan tour. She gets them to safety with her brother, which is very interesting. And that, that the, the person from the survey who saved is an ornithologist years later he will joke that clarence king would always say oh the indians are dangerous but in fact there was never anything to fear of the indians he will remark on that years later when he's at the smithsonian as an ornithologist at the time he was a teenage ornithologist on the trip loring's really interesting guy uh he's often said to write you know one of the first novels that could be called maybe a gay novel um he's he looks he's got great chops. He's a great writer. Um, he has, in my view, a tendency to really go after the local public. He, he writes as if he's kind of in a bubble, uh, in the kind of army military bubble. And in a way, he's safe to kind of make fun of local inhabitants and especially make fun of, of Native American people. Um, he befriends O'Sullivan or vice versa, not clear. O'Sullivan makes a picture of him that's quite charming, um, even fetching. But um, but he leaves after the river, the, the, the backwards river bro, he leaves to go back to Boston to lecture on the Indians, about which I would argue he doesn't know that much. But I shouldn't say anything because then he's murdered. Uh, he's in a stagecoach robbery. The, it, is off, it was said, it was reported in the New York Times days after that this was done by the Apache. But a military investigation wasn't so sure of that. And in fact, two people 
um, on the trip kind of disappeared and the mail was opened and money looks like it was taken out of the mail. So it's a long story, but everybody blamed the Apache and it was probably most likely, I would say even almost definitely not the Apache. Okay. Two last questions here. Um, there's a great interest uh, in Staten Island um, and what was going on in Staten Island and why were people so uh, focused on it? Uh, wasn't Olmsted from there? Didn't he spend time out there? Olmsted spent time out there. And he also, I'm sorry to cut you off. And he also spent time um, with Clarence, like in, in mining in San Francisco. Yeah. Who who isn't interested in Staten Island? I'm so interested in Staten Island. I went to Staten Island. The book ends in Staten Island. I don't know why. I've I've never. You know, I should go spend time and try to figure out why it's happening. I mean, uh, Brady lives kind of up on a hill, which is nice. Um, a kind of nice survey point, a prospect of the city uh, in Staten Island. But um, but I would argue. I mean, I was thinking of writing a piece about this. I mean, like this. You can really see the city from Staten Island. And when you take the ferry, you're it's necessary to understand that the city is in water. And that's another great thing about O'Sullivan is that he sees water in the land. Even the photo behind me, which is kind of cheesy to have a photo behind you, but I'm just going for it tonight. Um, but it seems as if he's getting gotten off a boat and he's looking back at the craft. And one has the sense that that he feels the mystery in being separate from where he is in that photo. And likewise, in this photo, this this um, Great Salt Lake photo, which I can just maybe I can zoom in on. I guess I can't. But it's 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 of the land, but it would be of the sea. So I think Staten Island is, aside from the fact that maybe my grandmother's family came from there, I'm not really sure. Um, and aside from the fact that it is the one place in New York that has no indigenous names in it in part because the treaties that the, the settlers made the local inhabitants sign were so brutal. In fact, they made their the people who signed them, the indigenous people who signed them, they made them bring their children to make their children sign too. Yeah. So aside from the fact that there's, I mean, there's just so much going on everywhere, but um, but it's it's a hill that looks out on water. It's also the highest point on the Eastern seaboard. Um, up to Maine, but um, so it's an amazing place. I we all have to go. I've been once. It's time to go back, um, if only on a history tour. So, a last question for you. You have um, a great number of fans um, uh, writing in who read your work. First off, we have some really smart, wise people who have said, "Is it the Peabody Sisters?" Two people have come up. Yes, with that. thank you so much. It's yes. the Peabody Sisters. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so to much. those of you in the chat. Actually, three people, most of them women. Uh, one anonymous. Thanks so much. Um, so, okay. So, so here's, go ahead. Well, just, it's amazing that they published Sarah Winnemucca's book. She goes around the East and says, hey, you're putting us in reservations and killing us. And and she makes the argument that that's not right. Meanwhile, when Loring is killed, the New York Times runs articles about how the Apaches killed somebody again. And it gives um, it gives people the argument that we ought to hunt these people down or put them on reservation. There's a guy named Collier who, in a very problematic way, says, no, we shouldn't do that. And he's he says he's accused of of not understanding. But anyway, what's the question? So this is the last question, and we'll we're it's our last question tonight. We're almost done. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Not to worry. Um, how did and these are folks who like your writing, including myself, how did you come to the voice you create in this book? and to your wonderful method of bringing yourself so gracefully into this book, and I would add into your published works as well. Um, a, a question about process. Uh, this must be someone, I mean, am I paying for this question? This is such a nice <laughs> question. The, um, I think that, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I, some days I think I'm amazing, which is probably not uh, a good way to go. Um, but but it is amazing that we can all get up and keep going on. But um, I think that just the kind of infinities in landscapes, like the way they think about water and so forth, I think these can mostly only kind of inspire, you know, a kind of humility, like in, in your body, like you feel small in places. And I think it's really powerful to feel small. And when I wrote this book, I meant it to be six months and no big deal. I was going to do it quick. I've seen all those places or I 
been around them. I was just going to go back to zero in. And then I kind of got laid up for a long time, for a good year or so. And I had to kind of re reimagine my life in a way. And I had a lot of people help me. Um, if my wife's out there, uh, she would be the one. But, um, but so, you know, like learning again to see something. In fact, there's a painter in the book who goes out with, with O'Sullivan and he, he, he wakes up after his trip with O'Sullivan and he's paralyzed on one side of his body. He has to learn how to paint again. In a way, I had to learn how to kind of write again. I wrote too much in this book, so I didn't really get it. It needs to be shorter, I suppose. But learning how to, to look again at your own place and at the land, there, those, I'm lucky that those two things can go together. Well, wow, that is beautiful um, and really helpful to all of us to understand your work. And I'm so glad that you feel better. Um, thank you, Robert, for sharing your wisdom and the visual feast that is O'Sullivan's work. Um, his photographs are penetrating and you can't help but feel kind of small and slightly haunted looking at them. They're absolutely beautiful. Uh, now, as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration Series, we've asked Robert to do a final reading from the book. So right. uh, back to you for that. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, this is goes with the first image. This is the opening of the book. This is an image of a fumarole, an opening in the crust of the earth that emits steam and volcanic gas. And it was made in 1867 in what was then the three-year-old state of Nevada, where the photographer set up his camera in a small dry basin that is still today an area of significant geothermal activity. It is an in-between place, or feels like it. The Sierra Nevada mountains rise a few miles to the east, and the hills of the Virginia Range are to the west and even closer. At the very moment this photographic plate was exposed, the Virginia rays was being hollowed out for silver. Regiments of men were digging through cave-ins and explosions, mining bigger and bigger cavities in the earth. None of this activity is pictured by fissure vent as the image's titles, nor is the molten rock that lies a thousand feet down, propelling steam up through crystalline cracks in the earth so fast as to cause the ground itself to rumble. An engine-like sound that in the 1860s earned the fumarole a nickname, Steamboat Springs. Also not pictured is the nearby resort built to exploit the adjacent hot springs. The springs were well known to the Northern Piote and Washoe peoples who, after pointing them out to settlers, were themselves now being monitored by white militias and by U.S. soldiers at nearby forts. If this picture seems to have less to say about resorts and leisure and more about violence, if it resembles a rift or a scar or even a wound, note that the man who made it had recently arrived in Nevada as an employee of the U U.S. Army. Note, too, that from 1861 through 65, he had served as the U.S. as a photographer all alongside the Union Army, following the troops as they fought against Confederate soldiers in the eastern United States. For the Army, he photographed maps and views of potential battle sites. And for publishers, he photographed soldiers and battlefields and dead bodies. His pictures alternately depict the mundane and the horrifying, and together they make up what are today the most widely known images of the war. The photographer's name was Timothy O'Sullivan. That photo will be with us for some time. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. Your presentation and your reading this evening has been particularly interesting as this past weekend was punctuated by still image photographs violence, and also the site of military maneuvers. We appreciate your sharing the story of Timothy O'Sullivan and reminding us of our country's history and explaining really the art form of photography, which remains really important to us, kind of understanding the world we live in, taking a moment and looking again. Thanks to our presenter, Robert Sullivan. What a trip you've taken us on. Such history. Um, as I said, it's a visual feast and so much food for thought too. Robert, we are really grateful. Also thanks to our tech producer, Kelly Nagel, behind the scenes and to the team at GBH Forum Network. And we thank our audience out there in Zoomland. We appreciate your interest in America's history and all of its diversity, stories, good and bad. We hope to see you soon again, but for now, a good night to all. And again, thank you, Robert.